Well, good morning. Good, morning. good to see you guys. Thank you for making OB1 a part of your daylight savings time weekend, right? Uh, that, that hour is gone. You'll never get it back, but that's okay. Um, my name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors, and it's my privilege to share the message uh, with you this morning. Man, I, I remember how excited I was to finally see someone that was really close to me uh, come to Jesus for the first time. They were far from God. They mistrusted the church. They mistrusted people in the church. And then finally, they came to Christ. And, and after they came to Jesus, you started to see them slowly get into the church start to try to trust some people and, 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 and learn more about God and learn more about church people. And then something happened. I, I knew these two other women. They didn't do it intentionally, but they took this, this new Christ follower that had just come to Jesus and they pushed her in a direction that she wasn't un, uh, 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 comfortable with. They pushed her in a direction that she didn't understand. Again, it wasn't their hearts, but because of that situation, because they pushed her down a road that she didn't understand since they pushed her down a road that she they were comfortable with it but she wasn't she stepped away from the church again I, I remember on, on my college campus when I was getting a business degree at Colorado State University I remember some some people in a booth that were that were talking about Jesus and talking about God. And it wasn't even that they were saying untrue things. It was the way they were doing it, the way they were saying it. I was so angry. And I'm not normally like this, but I was so angry that I went up to them and said, do you really think this is going to help people come to Jesus? Do you really think that's going to happen? Have you ever been there? where you were upset at how someone represented Jesus? Or maybe someone's actions, intentionally or unintentionally, kind of like the two ladies that I knew, they, they didn't, if they would know that today, they'd be heartbroken. They didn't even know that. Unintentionally or intentionally, someone's actions embarrasses you as a Christ follower? Like, oh. <laughs> how about this? Did you possibly never come, uh, not come to Jesus for a while or even a long time because of one of his so-called followers? Man, if you're here today and you're skeptical about Jesus because you've met one of his followers, can I say I'm sorry? Can I just say I'm, I'm sorry? That's tough. I'm not pretending to know how you feel, but, but I've been hurt and betrayed by Christ followers as well. It hurts, and it's disorienting. And I, can I say this to you? Please know that some that say that they follow Jesus really aren't. They don't have the heart of God. And can I also say this? Uh, while I'm not excusing a Christ follower's actions, even if they do have Jesus, we all mess up at times. Maybe you already have Jesus, but because someone hurt you, you thought to yourself, Man, I'm not walking away from God, but man, I don't need the church anymore. Have you ever thought that before? Like, I, I don't even need to be a Christ follower to go to church. That's a true statement. But God still wants you in church because guess what? You are the church. And you can't walk away from yourself. It'd be kind of weird, right? Uh, for, for, I'm sure for most of us, we've experienced one of those people before, right? It's not fun, and I hope God has helped you process through the pain and the hurt of that. But I now want to flip the script. It's so important that each of us continue to chase after the heart of Jesus so that none of us accidentally become one of those people, right? It's so important because you never want someone else to have a bad view of God, struggle to come to Jesus, or trust the church because of you or because of us. I love this quote by Pastor Rick Warren. He says this, Two of the reasons that people don't come to Jesus is because they've never met a Christ follower or because they have met a Christ follower. <laughs> Ouch, right? It's like, oh, man. 
Now, we may not go to the extreme, so it may not seem as obvious, but if we're not careful and we don't continue to chase the heart of Jesus, we can accidentally become one of those people to others. I'll give you an example of why I know this. Do you remember when you were younger and your parents did or said something that embarrassed you? or did or said something that you felt they were too strict on or that you didn't agree with, what did you say? I will never be like my parents. I will never do that. I will never say that. Let me give you an example from my life. When I was younger, I remember that we didn't have this, but my grandfather had this miraculous thing called HBO. I said, you remember HBO? Oh my gosh, it was such a treat to go to my grandfather's house to watch HBO. And there was a movie coming on that I wanted to see for a long time. I was like, yes, I can finally watch it because Poppy has HBO. There was one problem. It was PG-13. And I wasn't 13 yet. And sometimes my parents could be strict in that way. And so I was like, okay. If there's going to be one that's less strict about this than the other, it's probably my dad. So I'm going to go to dad. Dad, Poppy has HBO. You know we don't have that, right? Let's guilt trip him a little. You know we don't have HBO, right? Uh, because, he doesn't ha- because we don't have HBO and he does, can I watch this movie? What's it rated? Crap, this isn't going to end well. It's rated PG-13. Nope, can't watch it. I was so angry at my dad that day. I was so angry at him. My mom, being the peacemaker of the family, probably knew this, and so she wanted to play with a game with all of us, and she's like, Chris, why don't you be with your dad? And I said something like this. I either said, no, I don't like him. Or I said, no, I think he's stupid. Now! I love my dad, and he's amazing, but there's some context that you need to know about my dad. He's in the military, or he was in the military. You don't say that to the major. You do not say anything like that to the major. Now, my mom, probably knowing this, like immediately told me to go to my grandfather's room, probably to save me. Like, like, hey, husband, I I will make sure this goes down well. Okay, Chris, go to your room right now. Guess what's happened? I will never not let my kids watch PG-13 movies. I will never limit their watching. Guess what's happened to me as a parent? Guess what's happened to me? My kids have been frustrated at me, too, when I've felt that there were things not appropriate for them to watch either. And and then it's that moment you're like, crap, I'm my parents, right? It happens. With some things, you eventually realize that your parents are smarter than you thought. So you start following some things that they do and say, but there's, because none of our parents are perfect, there's always those things that you're like, you know what? I never want to say that. I never want to do that. And guess what happens one day? Oh my gosh, I sound like them, right? I just said what I never wanted to say. I did what I didn't want to do. Just like we can become like our parents in some ways we didn't want to, if we're not careful, we can become one of those people the people that frustrated us, the people that embarrassed us as Christ followers, the the people that caused us not to want to come to Jesus or to deal with the church in the first place, the people that we felt judged by, the people that we never, ever wanted to be. And while we all have to fight off becoming like one of those people, thankfully, we don't have to become one of them. Guys, people are looking for hope, just like you look for hope, People are looking for hope too, and God asks his followers to bring hope to others. And as we enter back into our Acts series, 
I want to talk to you today about some steps that you can take to avoid becoming one of those people and instead make a difference in others. To give you a little context, we're going to hit Acts 15 here. To give you a little context, Jesus has obviously died now. And so Christ followers are trying to figure this thing out still between, you know, following the law versus Jesus is great, following the to-dos and to-don'ts versus Jesus and what he did for us. So, so know that context going into Acts 15 here. You can follow along on the screen in your notes, wherever you'd like. Acts 15 says this, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. Here is what they were teaching the believers. Moses commanded you to be circumcised, they said. If you aren't, you can't be saved. I'm so thankful that there's a but <laughs> in, in, in these verses right here, because that would be crappy if it stopped right there. But it says this, but... Paul and Barnabas didn't agree with this. So number one in your notes, and then I'll explain it. Number one in your notes, if you're going to be someone that avoids becoming one of those people and makes a difference in others instead, keep it about Jesus. Paul and Barnabas were in such disagreement about this thing that they're like, oh my gosh, we need to go there. We, no, 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 this can't infiltrate. This cannot get in. I want to put this in context for you. This was 300 miles away from where they were. So let, let's, let's bring this today. San Luis Obispo is 300 miles from San Diego. When's the last time you've went there to sort something out? Like, you know, I'm going to face the five. I'm going to trace, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll face traffic. I need to go, this is so important that I need to, that I need to uh, get there to sort this thing out. Let's put more context on this. They didn't have Antioch Airlines back then. They didn't have Jerusalem's greatest Uber drivers. They didn't have your latest, greatest Toyota Prius back then, right? This journey would have taken a long time. It must have been super important for them to go there. And it actually was super important because it, instead of it being about grace through faith in Jesus, people were trying to add rules and moral standards to get to Jesus. Essentially, they were saying, if you don't do this work, their example was circumcision. You can't have Jesus. Even when Paul and Barnabas got there, there was such impassioned debate about it. As we grow in God, we have to fight against this type of heart too and simply keep it about Jesus for ourselves, keep it about Jesus for others that are far from God and even people that are new to Jesus. Now I want to make something very clear because pastors are never misunderstood. <laughs> um, that's a lie, by the way. Uh, I want to make something very, very clear. Keeping it about Jesus doesn't mean that we're not growing. It's very important to grow in God and follow him with our lives. As we grow in God, we start to believe things that we used to not believe. We develop habits that help us get to know Jesus and his ways. All of this may even produce traditions within us that help us cultivate and create a great relationship with Jesus. Hear me, these are all good things. Keep doing them. But also hear this, doing those things, believing those things, going deeper, never brought you to Christ in the first place. It was always his grace and what he's done for you. It was by grace through faith that he saved you. It's still, if you're, str if you're struggling today, it's still about grace through faith in Jesus. Why is this important? If we're not careful, we can accidentally start to push beliefs, habits, and traditions on people instead of keeping it about Jesus. When this happens, people then feel that they have to align with our beliefs. Notice I said our beliefs instead of Jesus. They feel like they have to start aligning with our beliefs, our traditions, our ways. And then in their mind, there's barriers up. They're confused. They seem far away. Let me ask you this. Do you remember 
what you were like before you came to Jesus or when you were a new believer? Remember the beliefs you had before Jesus changed you? Do you remember the viewpoints you had before you came to Jesus? Better yet, if it happened, it might have not happened to everyone. I hope it didn't happen to everyone, but maybe it has. But do you remember the people that frustrated you and actually pushed you away from Jesus before you came to God? Unless it was God himself, do you remember the people that drew you into Jesus and made you think, whoa, maybe, there's so maybe there is something about this God. Let me ask this, was it rules that brought you to Jesus or was it his grace? Was it behaving a certain way? Do that. Don't do this. That brought you to Jesus? Or was it knowing that you were loved no matter what you did or didn't do? Was it believing certain things about the Bible? You need to believe this. You can't believe that. Your viewpoints are wrong here. That's not God's way. That brought you to Jesus? Or was it simply believing in what Jesus did for you? Then... Once you believed, he helped you start to believe the things in the Bible. You see the difference? You see the power in that. Even if you had Jesus when you were little, you're like, no, pastor, that really doesn't relate. Maybe you had Jesus when you were little, but then you went through a rebellious stage. Many, many can do that. What brought you back? It was most likely his grace, his love, and what he did for you on the cross. Have you ever been shocked or angry when others don't live by the values of Jesus? I, and I get it. It's not, a, I, it's not a trick question. I get it. As we grow in Jesus, his values start to become more and more important to us. And they should. Again, let me make some things clear. They should. Jesus' ways and values should become more and more important to us. But I love what Pastor Gary Northrup, pastor of Timberline Church in Fort Collins says, he says this, how can we expect them to have a Holy Spirit conscious if they don't yet have the Holy Spirit? Do you see that? When we see, hear, or experience someone that acts completely different from us, it should not be a shock and it's not a sign to give up on someone. It's a sign that they either need Jesus or need to grow in Jesus. And here's a bombshell. Even if they come to Jesus and then grow in Jesus, they'll still have different views and thought processes from you. Here's, here's like a big bombshell. My wife and I, this May, will be married for 20 years. Okay? Woohoo! Yes! Love that woman. She's at the women's retreat right now. Actually, they're probably driving home, so pray for safety for everyone. After 20 years, after both of us chasing after Jesus, imperfectly, of course, after 20 years of loving each other on the same path together, guess what? We still have so many different views, different parenting views, raising our kids' views, moral views, spiritual views, you name the view, we probably have a little bit of opposite, right? Anybody? Don't look at them. Don't stare them down. No, don't go there. I'm obviously going to the extreme, saying that every view we have is different, but we even have different habits and beliefs at times. Two people that have loved Jesus a lot of their life, two people that have been on the same path together a lot of their life, and still just so different. And while we're not perfect at it, something awesome often happens if we stay humble. If we stay humble, we're like, whoa, I can learn from her. Oh, I can learn from him. Could you imagine what a church would look like if every person in that church kept it about Jesus? that church would make a huge dent in its community and in the lives of others. The only way we'll get there, Obi-Wan, let's keep chasing after it. The only way we'll get there is if we keep it about Jesus. 
for some of you that have Jesus, maybe you don't struggle with placing this on other people, but you struggle with placing it on yourself. Your standards are so high that you slowly crush yourself. Guys, can I say this? And again, hopefully another moment where it's not misunderstood. God knows you're not perfect. That's why he had this solution called Jesus dying on the cross for your sin problem. He knew that you'd mess up. And while every mess up you have, while every sin, I'm not sweeping your sin under the rug. Every sin is important because every sin took Jesus to the cross. But God knew that Jesus would go there for you. When you mess up, you don't have to wonder if God still loves you. He does. When you mess up, you don't have to wonder if you're still going to heaven. Because this thing was never about what, who you are or the performance you could do. It's always been about who Jesus is and what he did on the cross for you. And when you struggle, if you're just way too hard on yourself, remember, keep it about Jesus. Because if you want to avoid becoming one of those people for others or even yourself where you're just slowly attacking yourself, and instead you want to make a difference, keep it about him. As they are continuing to work through and discuss this super, and you're starting to see how important this topic was. I'm so glad they had it um, so that they could pass this on. Peter got up and started speaking to them. Listen in to discover how we can avoid, again, becoming one of those people. Acts 15.8 says this, God knows the human heart. By giving the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, he showed that he accepted them. Circle this in your notes or underline it on your phone. He did the same for them as he has done for us. God showed that there's no difference between us and them. That's because he made their hearts pure because of their faith. Number two, if you're going to avoid becoming one of those people and instead make a difference in others, remember what he's, he did for me. Guys, it's time to remember what Jesus has done for you. God has blessed me and Robin with two amazing kids. They're, they're 18 and 16, and we still love them. <laughs> we, actually still, we actually still want them around at this age. Now, they that might not always want to be around us, at this age, but we love having them around. They're close to us. We, we're a close family. Doesn't mean we're a perfect family. We're a close family. And there's times where, where I'm just like, why did I get angry at them for that? That was so stupid. And there's times where they, where they make mistakes as well. None of us are perfect. There's this thing. I don't like who invented this thing called the teenage parent divide. Have you ever experienced this thing before, right? All of us have. This natural teenage parent divide. Do you know what helps Robin and I at times overcome that divide? Remembering how we were at their age. When we do that, it puts things into perspective. It reminds us of where we came from and how it took consistent parenting, continuing to learn about Jesus and, and, and consistently experiencing life to become the people we are today. Now again, don't hear wrong. If they've done something wrong, it doesn't excuse it. It just gives Robin and I grace, understanding, and patience. I believe we have better grace, understanding, and patience with others when we simply remember what Jesus has done for us. You know what? I didn't have it all together when I first came to Jesus. In fact, that's why I came to Jesus in the first place. I didn't have it all. Man, some of the views that I had back then when I first came to Jesus, my views are completely different now. My, in fact, a lot of my life is different now. A lot of my doubts are different now. In fact, heck, I still doubt sometimes and I've had Jesus for 15 years, right? Or however many years you've had Jesus. 
man, there's still parts of God's truth that are hard for me to accept. Is that really in there? You know, if I really think about it, I came to Jesus because of Jesus. I came to Jesus when I didn't have it all together. I came to Jesus when I didn't believe everything that I was supposed to. I came to Jesus still struggling through things, and I still struggle now. And because of this, I need to give others a break and keep it about Jesus for them. I need to give my family, my friends, my neighbors, my coworkers, my boss, heck, I even need to give my Facebook and Insta friends a break. Some of you know what I'm talking about on that one. I'll move on. Peter said something similar in his plea. Listen in. Acts 15 says this. Now then, why are you trying to test God? You test him when you put a heavy load on the shoulders of Gentiles. Our people of long ago couldn't, can't, couldn't carry that load. We can't either. No, we believe we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus. The Gentiles are saved in the same way. Guys, let's not make it hard for people. Don't make it hard on yourself. Like Peter said, let's not place things on ourselves or on people that we can't even carry ourselves. That's why Jesus came. Keep it about him. If you're one of those people that are way too hard on yourself, while following Jesus' ways are very important, again, hear that. Following Jesus' ways are very important. God doesn't love you less when you mess up. I said it before and I'm saying again, God doesn't love you less when you mess up. And guess what? He doesn't love you any better when you do something good. His love is constant and consistent and it's deep and it goes beyond your wobbly attempt at action. Keep it about Jesus. You want to avoid becoming one of those people and instead make a difference? Remember what he did for you. After Peter spoke, Paul and Barnabas shared stories of the cool things that God was doing. And then some dude named James spoke up. Now, to give you a little context on James, he was the brother of Jesus. And so if anyone knew the heart of Jesus, it was James. So James... Listen into what James says as they're having this debate and kind of shoring it up to see how we can avoid being one of those people. He says this in Acts 15. Now here's my decision. We should not make it hard for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We should not make it hard. Number three, if you're going to be someone that avoids being one of those people and instead makes a difference either in your own life or in the life of others, help remove barriers. Help remove barriers. James understood something. He knew, and I'll, I'll say it again so that I'm not misunderstood. He knew that God's standards were important. He knew that. He even suggested that they write a letter and to the people that were being taught wrong, and he says, hey, let's put a few standards in there, but those standards were to help them, not burden them. Because he also knew this, this is what James knew, while God's standards were important, while God's ways were important, those things didn't save a darn person. Jesus dying on the cross and accepting him does. And James knew that, and so that's why he said, let's not make it hard. Hey, we might still be figuring it out on what it means to live after Christ died in this thing called grace, but let's not make it hard. Let's not make it hard. Have you ever seen a baby attempt to walk? Have you even your own kid? It's pretty exciting when it's your own kid, right? And what do you do? There's certain things that you might do. You might hold their fingers to help. You might help them grip on a table so that they have some strength. You, you'll do, if there's toys or Legos or Beanie Babies or whatever your kids like, you will remove those things so that they can start to walk, right? 
What are you doing in that moment? You're removing the barriers for them so they can walk. And when they finally take their first step towards walking, you celebrate. You're like, yes, I'm so proud of you. You're so amazing. You're like the smartest baby in the world. <laughs> Except for the fact that most babies walk too, right? But <laughs> your baby's the smartest. Your child's the smartest. You don't go up to your baby and say, you know what? That really didn't count because your leg was kind of wobbly. <laughs> you know what? Real life says that nobody's going to remove barriers when you walk. You're going to have to do that by yourself. So baby, that didn't count. You're not saying that to your kids at all. You're celebrating with them. Guys, let's not make it hard for ourselves or for others to come to Jesus or to grow in him. We need to make it easy by removing the barriers that prevent people from walking towards him, whether for the first time or as they grow in him. Let's not be a barrier ourselves by being one of those people. Let's make a difference. See, God just doesn't say, hey, I want you to avoid being one of those people. He says, I want you to proactively make a difference by removing barriers. Because we all have them. I need two volunteers. Thank you all for volunteering yourself so well. Please, I just need two. Yes, okay, John and Adam come up onto the stairs here. This is going to be awesome. So, John, come on up here. Adam, both of you step up, step up here. I'm going to have you talk for five minutes each. No, I'm just teasing. Don't faint on me. John, you get the proud privilege of being Jesus today. So, uh, uh, John, go behind this barrier here so that nobody sees you. Don't do anything weird back there. No, I'm just teasing. So, oh good, this isn't connected. It was connected at first service. Guys, I don't have time to do this today, obviously. I could set up. So Adam, you stand, you stand right here, Adam. Sometimes people have so many barriers to Jesus. It would, you need a picture of this. It would be like, it'd be like these barriers would be longer than out that door. But for time's sake, we can only do a few. Guys, there's so many barriers that either we can face when we're trying to see. You notice this barrier's up? He can't see Jesus right now. Adam can't see Jesus. And there's so many barriers that are put up. Adam might feel shame. Adam might feel guilt. I can either point him to Jesus or make him feel more guilty. But I have to remember, I'm not going to make it hard for myself. And I'm not going to make it hard for him. Adam, Jesus can take your shame and guilt if you ask him to. You don't need to let shame and guilt destroy you anymore. God, Adam's such a different person than I am. We have such different beliefs. We have such different lifestyles. God, would you, would you please help me to never be one of those people? Would you continue to show me that, show me how, Jesus, you hung out with people of different beliefs and lifestyles all the time. That's why they came to you, because you showed that you loved them anyways. Would you show me how to love Adam and to point to Christ instead of trying to push my lifestyles and belief on him? And then, Whatever this final barrier is, like I said, it could be a million of them. It could be pride. It could be he's wounded. Maybe he's facing doubt. Jesus, would you give me the privilege? Give me the privilege. He's going to have to step. I just don't want to knock you over here. Jesus, give me the privilege to help him see who Jesus really is. Thanks, guys. <laughs> guys, think of yourself. Think of your neighbors. 
Think of your coworkers. Think of your friends. Think of your family that don't have God. Or think about people in your life that have recently come to God. Or maybe you just recently came to God. Let's help both sets of people remove the barriers by keeping it about the one that gave his life for us. Let's simply point to him. Oftentimes, the barriers are in our own minds. Sheesh, look at the kind of life they're leading. They wouldn't even be interested in coming to Jesus. Or, oh man, they're probably going to be the type of people that just laugh at me. Um, they wouldn't, I could invite them to Obi-Wan, they just laugh it off. Who knows what people's responses are going to be? But can I tell you, never say someone's no for them. Simply point them to Jesus and see what Jesus does. Because he's still the God that saves. He's still the God that allowed his son to go to the cross because he believed throughout humanity that people could come to him. And if we believe in that God, we believe he can do it for others too, right? He can. He can. As we start to close, I wanted to share some powerful thoughts with you that I came across recently. If your experience with Christ has left you with more guilt and less joy than you found religion, not Jesus. Religion shackles and binds. Jesus releases and frees. Religion can bring unhealthy guilt and shame. Jesus brings forgiveness and joy. Religion is about what you do for God. Jesus is about what he's already done for you. For yourself, please keep it about Jesus. Please. And again, that statement does not mean we don't grow. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have standards for us to follow. But please, along the way, as you're growing, as you're attempting to walk this life, keep it about Jesus. Because it's so easy, once you have him, to make it about something else or other things. It's always been about him and will always be about him. There truly is forgiveness, joy, and freedom in Jesus. Second, please make sure that you're, what you're sharing and passing on to others is Jesus and not something else. It's so important. It's so important to not let it become about our own agenda, our own habits, our own lifestyle choices. It's so important because it really can be the difference between drawing someone to God or pushing them farther away from God. And even in your own life, it's so important to keep it about Jesus so that you're drawing towards God instead of pushing your own self away from God. All of us have to fight becoming one of those people. Every single one of us. And as we start to close, if you can bow your heads and close your eyes,